Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chris Anthony Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today we're talking about the soundscape in minutes 66 through 70 of Star Wars A New Hope. This set of minutes starts with the Millennium Falcon getting pulled in by the tractor beam and ends with Obi-Wan splitting ways from the group. And I'm really pleased today to have Brandon from Talking Bay 94. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Thank you for joining me on this in this very pivotal set of minutes. A, a lot of important things happen in, in these five minutes. It's, they're just action-packed, for sure. Yeah. So the last set of minutes that I had... Um, the last, like the last guests, the last five minute chunk, I guess, had almost no music. And it was sort of, um, it was right before the crew was getting pulled in by the tractor beam. So that sort of was like the five minutes of like loading the gun in many ways, or like the calm before the storm. And Mm -hmm. now this is when sort of things are starting to happen. Like now that little, yeah, now the tractor beam cats out of the bag, like we're on the death star, things are about to go down. Like it's starting now. Yeah. It's very interesting because we've been on the Death Star before, right? For conferences or for meetings or for um, interrogations. But then when the heroes actually make it on, it kind of takes on a life of its own, right? You see more of it. You kind of feel the the whole scope of it almost, even just kind of seeing the inside um, even more. And so it's it's a very interesting um, five minute like kind of push to the next next act. Yeah, that's a good point because the Death Star is really, really big. So even though we have like seen many parts of it, it seems like there's always a new corridor or like a new little area that we're discovering yeah. throughout this movie. And we haven't even gotten <laughs> to the trash compactor yet. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm going to play a little bit from the beginning of the minute so we can hear like how the music leads us in. You're not going to get me without a fight. Uh... You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. So already there, uh, it's like there's a little intro, and then it goes right into the like Imperials thing. Yeah. It's very interesting, right? The it, it, like you said, the imperial motif, but then also it, you you ended right when it's kind of going into the rebel fanfare too, a little bit, which is kind mm-hmm. of an interesting juxtaposition, right? Where you're kind of getting both elements playing against each other. I feel like as they're entering, you know, as they're kind of entering the belly of the beast, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's interesting that there's like in this moment where the Falcon is getting pulled in by the tractor beam. It's kind of like, uh, not defeat. Cause we know like the long story, but this isn't like a proud moment for them. Right. And we're hearing the rebel fanfare. Right. And so it is, it is an interesting juxtaposition to hear there. And, you know, it could just be because the rebel fanfare wasn't as fully crystallized as what it was, or maybe it's like, I don't know, like who knows why that's there, but, but it's there and the <laughs> heroes are all about to meet each other. So I don't know. No. Yeah, definitely. No, it's interesting again. And it has the the percussion, I think, in in the Rebel Fanfare part, especially, right? Like militant and kind of very, susp- the whole thing is really building to suspense. And there's elements we'll talk about later that are like really masterful suspense moments that Williams is pulling out. And this is kind of the first, like they're in real, real danger at this point. And so. It's yeah, scary. like so much so that even Hans just like, you know, they they've given up on even trying to get out of the situation. They just know <laughs> that they're they know that they're screwed. So, yeah. What That's I think crazy. is um I think it's I think th- I really like the music going in and if those are if people are listening on the soundtrack, this coincides with the beginning of Inner City um on the soundtrack. And so to go back to what we're hearing here at the beginning, we have these like <laughs> You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. Okay, so so what I'm hearing in that is um, alternating like diminished 
and minor triads being outlined. And what I mean by that is like, it's kind of going. So this is called a diminished triad. Um, and it just has to do with like the space between each note, uh, the space between the notes. Um, basically, okay, this, we're in B minor, we're in B flat. This is, sorry, this is a B flat diminished chord. Um, if I were to play B flat major, it would sound like this. And most people can hear the difference between major and minor. So major, minor, diminished is you're taking the top note down another half step. So it's um, more cramped than minor. Um, and what's happening here, it's like, And every now and then, like, sometimes the top note goes to the F, which results in it kind of going between diminished and minor. So it's cramped, a little bit less cramped, cramped, a little bit less cramped. And basically what's happening here is, like, the way that the melody is outlining these triads as they approach the death star, it's like one note will change at a time and that changes the quality of the chord. Um, so like things like major, minor, diminished, augmented, uh, those, that word that qualifies the like letter name that you're giving it, that's called the quality of the chord. So changing something from diminished to minor is like changing the quality of it. Um, and you can do that just with one note. It, major and minor is just one, one note away. You just change one note, change one more note, diminished change one more note and it's like you get the point so basically what's happening here is we have and then the bottom note start change and then it goes it basically what I'm saying is like in this very small space it goes to a lot of um, places chromatically and then the gist of it is like right before the rhythm comes in like the martial rhythm it sets up so you can hear what the, you can almost hear what the penult, you can almost hear what the, I'll play it again, but you can hear what the note leading up to the, because it's a leading tone and a leading tone is a tone that is just a half step below it. It's, and so you know it's gonna wanna go up. So if none of that made sense, I'll play it again. To me, I I was I'm loving this. This is okay. great. You 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 keep going. <laughs> okay, um, but b if uh, if I'm going too fast on anything, let me know because um, listeners will probably appreciate it too. <laughs> okay. You can't win, but there are alternatives to fighting. It's suddenly gone. <laughs> Do you hear right before it goes da 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 da? Yeah. Yeah. It's I so like good. that. It, it's <laughs> so good. No, I okay, it's so good. And uh I'm not to speak for your listeners. I have and I shouldn't actually I shouldn't say this because then it's gonna make me sound more experienced than I am. I have basic, very basic music theory, the the tiniest amount of training. I mean I did violin for when I was growing up, so probably from eight to 20 ages eight to 20 so i have that going for me and that's all i have but that was a decade ago no at this point so i know nothing anymore but sometimes you like you'll say it i'm like yes i do i i, I, remember. I remember that <laughs> yes that's that's coming back so uh that's awesome that's awesome um and functionally speaking um setting something up with a leading tone is a very it's it's something that like as a composer, I recognize when it's happening because it's, it's like something that you do. Like, uh, so I, I was also a dancer growing up and there's like a certain, um, repertoire of like movements or preparations and things you do before you're like about to turn or a leap. It's called, you, you'll, you'll prepare for a turn and you'll make, and basically what that means is like, you make sure that you, your weight is just distributed to the right part. Like you're kind of on the right foot to step into something else. So it's like, in music, um, things are often written in a similar way, or you just functionally speaking, like before you have something that you want to hit on, you kind of want to make sure that it's being prepared by something that 
um, that prepares people for what's to come basically and prepares you um, for that thing. It's like making sure that you take a, uh, that you breathe out before you breathe in again or something like that. So <laughs> moving on to these, these, okay, it's a simple, it's just on a C and Frank Lehman calls this martial rhythm in his um, complete catalog of the musical themes of Star Wars. And it's very reminiscent of Mo uh, Mars from the planets in, by Gustav Holtz. And Holt, how do I say it? Holst, Holst. And um, it's very, it's hard to play on the on this little keyboard myself because it goes pretty fast, but it's a very Williams, it's a very John Williams Star Wars rhythm that is like just part of the DNA of Star Wars at this point. It's... Uh, We love it. It's great. Yeah. It's automatic. Like, if you play that anywhere, you'd be like, yep, there's Star Wars. Like, that's a Star Wars something. Yep. Absolutely. So that's the Marshall Rhythm. And let's see if um, Frank Lehman writes it in the catalog somewhere. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He calls it assortment of march rhythms, often with triplets or Holstein asymmetrical patterns underneath other motifs, which checks out here because then we hear it underneath the Rebel fanfare. So it's used variously for Empire slash First Order and Rebels slash Resistance. So that and the Rebel fanfare is how we start out. And then we're moving on. And what do you think of like these shots that are happening? So it's interesting because like watching it, it was it was very nice today being able to watch it all like very um hyper focused on what was actually occurring you know and just the amount of scope that they immediately bring right by showing the falcon so small especially and giving that the kind of edge it needs to really make it feel like you're approaching something enormous and and really kind of delving into like i said the belly of the beast i do love um and this is just me loving behind the scenes people and stuff when you see the um, space troopers uh when they're entering right it's the two troopers with the um, jetpacks on the back or the breathing apparatuses whatever it is um those are both played by the same visual effects let he, joe johnston who is now like a big director he directed captain america and the rocketeer and honey i shrunk the kids but that's him twice because all their costumes had gotten stolen at that point because like this he's is like playing both on. officers mm -hmm. it's a split screen uh and so he's he's both and there's a really great photo of him without the helmet and uh anyway that's both of him i didn't which know is that funny. that's cool yeah yeah so that's that's what i can add to this conversation is the behind the scenes minutia uh oh <laughs> that please <laughs> please i love it please offer it and that's like an area of expertise that you have through your podcast um so listeners, if you're not already familiar with Talking Bay 94, um, you interview like cast and crew from Star Wars, right? Yeah. So that's that's the the main brunt of it. I just, it's one-on-one -on -one interviews with with people that worked on Star Wars in, in some professional capacity. So cast and crew, and then sometimes authors or illustrators or whatever it is. But I really do love my, my favorite is just the ILM, like especially the the older generation of, of visual effects artists uh just kind of paving the way through all these movies and that's who i love to, to talk to the most oh my gosh okay yeah if there's more people that you encounter or that we see in in the set of men or really honestly in a new hope please just um, <laughs> please let, let us know uh, um so i'll keep playing here Magnetic field. So this is when you're saying it's the double person? Mm hmm It's a moment where the... Okay, I love... The, like, the music totally changes rhythms there, huh? Yeah. And it's easy to hear, like, from the music that the scene is changing. I'm going to play that transition again. Your stations. Come with me. Yeah. 
Love it. I love it. I it's and and those corridor scenes are so like again intrinsically Star Wars in my mind. Right, not only like the lighting and how that's all shot, and you know that they only have two or three of those that they just reuse over and over again. But then, um, my one of my favorite sound effects is just the 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 clanking of the boots on that mm. surface is is I think so, and you hear it a lot, especially in this five minutes, um, and it kind of gets added as it gets more and more intense um for for everybody and then you couple that with maybe my favorite the star wars sound effect which is um the mouse droid <laughs> but we can talk about that oh uh, i love the mouse droid especially here it's so it's yeah the high-pitched scurrying um it's so good yeah and i hear it much better on headphones along with the footsteps which yeah. sound really crisp and that's something that i really that I wrote down for these minutes. I mean, I'm sure they're crisp in all of the scenes, but it kind of made me wonder if maybe they're even crisper here because uh, our heroes are kind of hiding underneath something. So to hear footsteps walking above them would be more, I don't know. Yeah. But, but the thing is like, it's not even in those shots. So it's not even a POV thing. It's just, I'm just, my ear is more drawn to the footsteps in this set than ever ever before right yeah uh and and i wonder if you have any insight into kind of the music that was playing during that corridor scene because i feel like at at one point near the end especially as they're running it really kind of starts to match up a little bit with the actual running sounds right like ben burt and john williams are kind of working hand in hand there oh like the percussion maybe the percussion and the footsteps i don't think it's directly on beat i could be wrong but i think it is kind of close in terms of of how they're hitting oh i don't know i don't i don't remember if there's like exact synchronization but there is like it's going like um there is like a meter change so there's like um it's not just like the music is changing while things are speeding up whether that's um exactly timed or whether it's more of like um it was scored that way because uh john williams could see that things on screen were hastening up uh i don't know the order of that but i i kind of hear what you're saying i just don't know if it's like exact but something about like the different um it's it seems faster to me like mm-hmm. even though the tempo is not faster, it's just I think I don't think the tempo is much faster, if any. It's the division of the bars, so it's like how many, um, how many beats until like the downbeat repeats. So it's like, does that make sense? You know, because mm-hmm. you yeah yeah. I love it. No, I think I mean again. I th- I think Williams is the last addition to the mix, right? I think he's the final the final piece i don't think they add any sound effects post williams i want to say i could be wrong there um i know they do some final tweaks in the editing because george is still doing edits while it's out right um but i don't know if who who ended who ended before who you mean like while a new hope was being made by while a new hope was being made yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah because i do know that like the first screening um there was no music right yeah. And a lot of people didn't get it or like it didn't really click for it a lot of people work. until the music yeah. was right. added. It would be so weird to watch this with no music. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it's the opposite of the the Ryan Johnson only music last Jedi cut, right? It's, the, <laughs> it's just yeah. Star Wars with nothing. Uh it would be great. But see, that is like that's what a composer has to work with. And right. so it's like kind of amazing that composers like can see what it is before their music and then do that. And of course I know there's temp tracks and everything. Right. So sometimes they already have like, they already kind of know the mood, but I think the temp track can just make it harder sometimes because then you just get attached to right. what was already in, in the scene. I don't know. I, I, yeah. Do you, I, cause I don't know. Do you have access to the like temp tracks for Williams? Like what he used at all? Cause I know we know some of it, obviously, like you mentioned the planets, you know, all these things that we know just tangentially, but this has someone put it together of like what he. I don't know if all of that is like public knowledge. I think sometimes, um, obviously for a new hope, especially we know like 
Stravinsky, Bride of Spring and everything because those right. are, and, you know, Benny Goodman for the cantina scene and things right. like that. But after that, I don't actually know. And I I do wonder how much of Williams' own music is tempt for his own scores at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that happens, you know, as the movies progressed, I think scores were tempt with other Star Wars music. Correct. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I honestly, I really want to know though. Right. I really want cool. to know. <laughs> yeah. Cause we know obviously like how Lucas tempt his own like dog fights and stuff with the, with the world roller, the, the movies, right. He like would insert the shots of the different fighter pilots and stuff from the world war one movie and everything like that. Um, and that's how they cut a lot of, especially the battle scenes. But again, oh, I'd be very interested. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's uh, you can see, I'm, I'm, it's, it's an, I, there's an exact movie, and there's, there's some side by side comparisons that you can pull up. I want to say it's a Battle of the Bulge movie, and that could be wrong, but, um, but there is, yep, yeah, Battle of the Bulge, Cinema Behind Star Wars, 1965, World War II movie, um, that they used as a, um, temp for for the um for the editing for, for the, the visual editing. cuts oh interesting see not only scores are tempt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so here are the officers like to your stations come with me and we have you know the hallway and the mouse droids as we were talking about and we have now we have something that the original script set calls hangar 2037 and this is when the troopers are standing with their weapons ready to fire. And the music sort of, it ends with this scene basically, because the next scene, when we switch over to the interior conference room with Tarkin, the music's out, which it often is like when Tarkin is in the scene. And so, yeah, he, does he have, does he have a um, motif or a theme of his own? I don't think so. Yeah, right. So I mostly hear it silence with him and with Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so he pushes down on the intercom. And so we hear the beep. And then we get like a little bit of um of like a soft sustained oboe chord. And for me, the overwhelming noise here is just the Death Star, like telemetry. Mm-hmm. The I think Ben Burt calls it like a heartbeat that he put onto the Death Star, which is, if you listen, you hear it so much. And it's just like, so it's weirdly warm, but it does add a sense of like making the Death Star feel like a living thing around right. them. And it's kind of, it's that ambient Star Wars noise that is really very present here and, and just in every kind of scene after too. Yeah. And the Death Star has like, the Death Star has that thrumming heartbeat, like you mentioned, but here and also along with that because the death star has like so many different sounds happening it's not just obviously one sound um it's a very like textured layered sound there's like those random like bleepy type Mm -hmm. sounds let me see if i can play some so mouse droid close all outboard shields close all outboard shields yes we've captured a freighter entering the remains of the alderaan system its markings match those of a ship that blasted its way out of Moss Eisley. They must be trying to return the stolen plans to the princess. She may yet be of some use to us. Really hard to hear. It's kind of like... Mm-hmm. Reminds me of like um, the large homestead as well. Mm-hmm. Just adding that life, adding adding some mechanics. Computers are doing stuff. Everything. Yeah. Important exactly. stuff. Exactly. I love that calm sound. I love that calm sound. I don't oh, know. I, I don't know it. what it is, but it's so it's so great. And then, have you? I can't remember. If, was that the first time you see a mouse droid in Star Wars, or is it before as well? Or is this the first mouse droid? It's the first time I noticed it. Because it's. I don't. It's. Um. I don't know how much we can talk about soundscape versus soundtrack, but this is another Ben Burt classic. This is Ben Burt doing doing his stuff vocalizing and what what this is is 
um he based it off of curly from the three stooges this uh his vocalization for mouse droid and then did he pitch uh, it up and then yes and then that is not just yeah it's not just straight up him he uh, he, he had to pitch up but uh, apparently it was like a running joke in the editing bay because george would do curly a lot as well like, and so it's then, like an impression for fun mm-hmm. and yeah. so then ben used that as inspiration and then did it for for the mouse droid you said it's from three stooges it's from three stooges Remind it's, me who Curly is. Curly is, I mean, he's one of the, the three. Uh, I don't know what the best way to, he has the, um, uh, uh, what's the best way to describe his, his look. He's just, he's like bald, uh, or something. Yeah. He's, he's the bald one. <laughs> okay. Right. And he yeah, does like little bald. noises with his mouth. He does little. Yeah. And it's like a, it's not like a goofy hook, you know, it's, but it's similar. I wonder if oh, I could. Oh, okay, okay. It's like um, okay. I'll drop a I'll drop a YouTube link in the show notes if people are interested. It's like I'm getting vague, really hints of flashbacks to like watching it with my grandfather. Right. Um, it's like fading in and out, but like I kind of like when you when I kind of think of like a mouse, I kind of am getting it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I don't think it was exact, but yeah, it's like a. Here, I'm, I'm pulling it up for myself so I can try to describe it. So it's a it's it's spelled out as a nyuk n y u k n y u k nyuk 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 and so That's then I funny. think he he pitches it up, um, which is a common like Ben a, Burt technique. Yeah. Um, we just had the Dejaric noises, which is also Ben Burt, um, mm-hmm. making the noises and pitching them up so that they sound tiny and i guess a mouse i mean why not do it with a mouse droid too right um and now it's of course like one of those iconic star wars sounds that's kind of an easter egg for people sometimes yeah um in the last jedi we had bb8 imitating a mouse droid Mm -hmm. yeah that was great i love Uh, the mouse droid yeah i actually didn't realize until i was doing this podcast and talking to i think it was adam Adam Lieberk Johnson that episode um, about the mouse droid. Like I didn't understand that BB-8 was making fun of the ma- was imitating the mouse droid. But <laughs> yeah. now yeah. I now I get it. So I feel all yeah. smart when I yeah. <laughs> when I can bring that up. Um, so okay, so the intercom is saying that they've captured a freighter entering the rem- remains of the Alderaan system, which um, I guess they're nearby because the Death Star moves right. Like it, it moves mm-hmm. kind of to get kind of close enough to the planet to do its thing. And so that's why when they were setting their course for Alderaan, they ended up kind of close to the Death Star instead. Um, Mm -hmm. So Vader's like, they must be trying to return the stolen plans to the princess. She may yet be of some use to us. (laughs) She's like, something inside of him wants to keep his daughter alive. Yeah, he doesn't exactly know why, but... He's like, don't, don't do anything just yet. It's such an interesting, it's such an interesting line. And, um, also in this next scene, which is when, um, they're in docking bay 2037 still. And the intercom is saying like, unlock one, five, seven, and nine release charge, uh, 316 report to control. And it's just so cavernous here. I, I, um, was very impressed there's the there's that shot right it's of just it's like the wide shot and a bunch of stuff is happening a bunch of people are running around there's like a ramp moving and and then you have that that intercom system that really again i've not noticed that much until i was really parsing it out for this and it's so thx 1138 right it's so um like harsh and so interesting that, that that's kind of he's still pulling from his previous movies uh, but it really just kind of paints this really, really cool picture of it being so broad and so just kind of um, full of life is the wrong word, but it's just full of things happening and it's bustling and it's very, very, um, very cool. Can you explain what part of it is like THX 1138? Yes, uh, specifically um, the intercom voice um, and how it is registered. And again, I need to now watch everything the way I watched it today. But um, the harshness of it 
um, and also just kind of maybe the static that they applied just really reminds me of a lot of how things are communicated in THX 1138, right? It's a very similar vibe of, you know, they were all kind of trapped or they're all kind of in their, in their world in THX. Um, and I feel like things get a little less harsh as we move into later movies, but that could just be me extrapolating. Um, but here, and I was even just thinking like, who was doing these voices? Like, we don't really know a lot of the, the voiceover talent for some of these things, right? For the throwaway lines. And then also just how, um, how throwaway the lines actually are, right? Um, like some of them are just kind of like talking about other things happening in the Death Star, where they're, it's just kind of building the world as opposed to, to telling the plot of the movie. Um, and so that's, that's again, just kind of the general vibe I was getting from especially those establishing shots of the, of the hangar, like you were saying. So I know that growing up, like I thought that these lines were sort of, I don't know, not filler, but just like random comms, whatever, not really that. And now that I'm going through it, I am kind of realizing how much is conveyed in those lines. I don't know. I'm like reading into them more. Um, They're suddenly more important to me um, (laughs) now that I'm not taking the story for granted. Like the, like now I understand that these, a lot of what is being said is conveying like what is happening, right? which is hard to understand when you just take the whole entire plot of the movie for granted. Um, Yeah. So let's actually hear some of that to hear the harshness of the comms. Unlock one, five, seven, and nine. Release charge. Three, one, six. There's no one on board, sir. According to the log, the crew abandoned ship right after takeoff. Was it the part before that, maybe? It must be a decoy, sir. Several of the escape pods have been jettisoned. Did you find any drugs? No, it was that part. No, sir. If there were any on board, they must also have jettisoned. Send a scanning crew aboard. I want every part of this ship checked. Yes, sir. <laughs> so it's hard. It's cap- captivating to listen to you, but wait. <laughs> There's no one on board, sir. Five, seven, and nine. Ship that blasted its way out of Moss Eisley. They must be trying to return the stolen plans to the princess. She may yet be of some use to us. That ambience is... Unlock. One, five, seven, and nine. Release charge. Yeah, what that intercom says to me is like, this is a very large room. Right. Yeah, and unlock. It's sound like One, that. five, seven, and nine. Release charge. Like, it's just, it's just so... I don't know. I, I really had a lot of appreciation, especially like this scene really stuck out to me when I was rewatching. I was like, that is like just in that very small moment and you have Vader and you have the troopers running and you have all these things. It really is just kind of masterful in terms of building out like how, how big this hangar is and, and what the, the whole extent of the, of the Death Star mechanism is. Because sound is one of those tools that can help establish Like one of the, I think one of the most important things sound does is establish the physical characteristics of either an object or a space. Um, Sound can tell, like you, sound can tell us how big a place is, what type of decor is in there, like what material is in there. For example, you hear something like that and you know that there's not that much furniture, like you know that it's kind of hard floors, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. hard inside. Um, And then sound, uh, when you're hearing like things drop or you're hearing objects interact with the environment, the sound can kind of help. Um, it like helps your brain uh, like automatically like fill in some blanks, some like fill in some gaps to like make it into a real thing. Mm-hmm. No, it's uh, again, masterful, um, like just design, um, not only the creation of the sound effects, but how they're all layered and how everything is, is happening all at once. And I'll note that the sound sound is worldized there too, which is sort of like making it sound like it is like making it believable from the room that it's in, which Ben Burt did a, does a lot of worldizing of sounds. And we've talked about it many times on the podcast, but basically it's like, instead of just dropping in the files, I don't know how they did it back then, dropping in <laughs> the sound files of what R2 sounds like and what other things sound like later it's sort of like playing them back on a speaker in a room kind of like that so that you can hear what the different objects and characters 
would sound like in a different space. Mm -hmm. um, really, like spatial awareness is like so important in sound in sound mixing. Like I can't I can't overstate that. Like it can make or break. It makes or makes or breaks um, the immersion. Yeah. No, it, real, again, uh, he he is uh, he is one of my uh, heroes, and he, I mean, this movie is like uh, just incredible for how young he is and what he's what he's doing. Oh, Ben Burt, know? yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so Vader says this line that just um, it's so funny to me the way that he trails off. He goes, "I sense something, a presence I have not felt since." <laughs> <laughs> And we're about to find out what that is, right? In, in the Kenobi show, right? We always assumed it was Mustafar the last time that they fought. But now, if there's going to be a rematch, then it's going to be the Kenobi show. So there'll be a new meaning to that line in oh, three yeah. months, six months, or whatever it is. Good call to leave that line hanging. <laughs> yeah, George was like, in 45 years or whatever. <laughs> like, I'll we, fill in that gap a... later. <laughs> yeah. No, it's too funny. I uh I don't know if you've talked about this before, and maybe I'm just completely off off base, and I've never noticed it again because I've never like gone minute by minute with Star Wars. I've never noticed Vader's breathing like kind of tripping on itself a little bit, right? Like you can hear the sound effect doubling up some of the time, and then it's also happening while he's talking, which I, I guess I've never like put those together, but it was very apparent in this scene, especially. So as for the breathing uh coinciding with the voice. Um, that definitely is something consistent with Vader. It, his breathing apparatus is clearly like separate from where he <laughs> speaks and, mm -hmm. you know, you can, yeah. Um, but it. as for the doubling up, I'm, I'm curious what you're, what you're referring yeah, to. Maybe play it and then maybe, I, maybe I'm just going crazy. Okay, um, let's hear it. Unlock one, five, seven, and nine. Release chalk. We're getting into it. There's no one on board, sir. According to the log, the crew abandoned ship right after takeoff. It must be a decoy, sir. Several of the escape pods have been jettisoned. Did you find any droids? No, sir. If there were any on board, they must also have jettisoned. Send a scanning crew aboard. I want every part of this ship checked. Yes, sir. I sense something. It speeds up. You mean how it's not like exactly regular? Like it's kind of like. Yeah. <sighs> exactly. Because oh. I, I always feel like it's more regulated, right? And then in this scene, it felt a little more uh, jammed together. Or like his breathing pace um, changed. He's getting nervous. He's getting kind of like ours getting, does. Yeah. Yeah, that calls into question how his breathing um, mechanics work. I mean, I th I definitely <laughs> have heard it. I definitely have heard it before. Usually, it is like pretty even, but sometimes mm -hmm. the time between the time that elapses between the last like down breath and the next up breath, um, sometimes it is short shortened. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm I'll pay more attention to that now in the future too. But thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, oh, that's. I was like, am I hearing that right? Like, I I don't know, but yeah, that's. Uh, at least I'm not uh, going crazy. Um, that's well, now I'm going to pay attention to when those are happening. Right. Um, As it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yay! New, <laughs> new sound <laughs> detail to just <laughs> learn out about. There it is. Um. So, Vader quickly turns and exits the hangar, and um, the officers like, "Get me a scanning crew in here on the double." I want every part of the ship checked. There's no one here. And then we pan down and we're in the Falcon hallway and we get more of those awesome footsteps, those those crunchy, like <laughs> those really crisp is like the word. Mm -hmm. They're crisp footsteps and the troopers going through the hallway. Um, and of course we know that Han and everyone else are underneath the, you know, underneath the floor pa panels. Um, so, then we see the floor panels kind of pop up. And guess who? Guess who? The music here is really... Um, well, maybe I'll play it before I describe it, and I'll let you describe it first. <laughs> so. Boy, it's lucky you had these compartments. Use them for smuggling. I never thought I'd be smuggling myself in them. 
This is ridiculous. Even if I could take off, I'd never get past the tractor beam. Leave that to me. Damn fool, I knew that you were gonna say that. Who's the more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? Yeah. So what do you think of I, that? I love it. Um, I read something and maybe you were going to talk about no. the opening being psycho opening being bernard herman apparently is like a, a small lift and then um can you explain a, i actually don't know what you're referring to yes it is the first let me pull it for myself are you saying that what we hear there is a call is a reference to herman's to a, score for psycho yes um like the first three like hits yeah, because it, oh, it, okay. it, uh, and maybe play it, and I can tell you That's exactly. Cool. Boy, it's lucky it, you had these compartments. Yeah, a, a tiny bit earlier, but. Yes, mm -hmm. Boy, it's lucky you had these. Do, do, do. Those, interesting. I mm -hmm. didn't know that. Yeah, and it's and again that that could just be like a an old wives' tale sort of thing um but i have seen that called out a couple times of of williams like directly pulling it um and talking about talking about it at some point and so um well, bernard Herrmann's I'll, definitely I'll let, like a, definitely an, uh, an inspiration for sure to john williams so he would definitely be familiar with with that music um it's like not a specific it's the music itself isn't like so specific that it's like, oh, it's a quote, like the Holst stuff right. it's is not, a lot more yeah. obvious, but it might be that like in similar types of scenes, there's a similar scoring technique, composition technique being used, like when there's yeah. a reveal maybe. Um, yeah, we'll have to fact check that. Or listeners, yeah, you fact check know. it, and then if I'm wrong, just cut it out and pretend no, that no, no. I didn't. <laughs> well, we're just saying here, um, we don't know for sure, but it might be a thing, and it, it could be just a legend. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but in any case, that music, it quickly goes into this like ominous force theme. And I guess ominous is in the eye of the beholder, but it is slow. There's like low strings doing this like meandering counter melody. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And it's, I, re I really like this version of the force. We don't hear it like this very often. There's no one here. Here we're getting into it. Boy, it's lucky you had these compartments. I use them for mm -hmm. smuggling. I never thought I'd be smuggling myself in them. This is ridiculous. Even if I could take off, I'd never get past the tractor beam. Leave that to me. Damn fool, I knew that you were going to say that. Who's the more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? Yeah, we have this like... The fool or the fat to me. Damn fool, I knew that you were... In the background? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's... I, I think it's beautiful, but obviously it's subjective and it doesn't matter if it's beautiful, but it is the fact that it's like the force theme, which we associate with Ben Kenobi so far and, and force things in general, but it's like, it's almost like, um, the orchestration of it in the low instruments, which sometimes can signify, uh, more ominous things, you know, like mm -hmm. later on, we're going to hear, uh, the main theme in a higher register and it's going to sound to me more optimistic um but this is really like meandering and um edge of your seat like edge of mm -hmm. my seat at least like i don't think i would have known like what to feel like i wouldn't i would be um i wouldn't feel secure in anything here i'd be like yeah just i hope that they get out okay yeah uh, and again, I, I think it, it goes to, again, putting myself in the shoes of like not knowing what is to come, not knowing exactly what their plan is going to be and how it's going to succeed. Um, it really does kind of 
help the audience move through that. And then as you watch later on, obviously we know the the end of Kenobi here later on. So it's kind of a, a weird, um, I don't want to use juxtaposition again, but it is kind of an interesting through line using the force theme in this, in this way. Yeah. And it makes me wonder if like people who watched this for the first time were at a point yet where the force theme was so ubiquitous that it, they were like, Oh, that's the force theme, but in a different version yet right yeah so that maybe is something that people noticed i'm guessing like on the second time they watched it or maybe the third time or something and never mind like i don't think you could just pop in like disney plus and rewatch 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 that part right yeah um so then we learned that han has those smuggling compartments for smuggling obviously yeah. and um we have some more ben and han riffing um, they love each other. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> best best friends. Yeah. Ben's like, leave that to me. And um Hans, damn fool. I damn fool. I knew I knew you were I knew that you were going to say that. And then of course, who's more foolish? The fool or the fool who follows him? Um and Chewie <laughs> weighs in. I do love uh again, rewatching and rewatching the scene and you sh- uh, it, you can see Han obviously hoist himself up and he's, you know, full of swagger and just kind of, but then if you watch Obi-Wan trying to do the same, he cannot, Alec Guinness cannot hoist himself up. And so he tries, I think, two or three times in the scene and you can see him just <laughs> continuing to try and then finally just giving up and kind of just, and putting some weight on his shoulders. Um, but it's kind of a funny, again, um, the two of them in a physical way riffing off of each other it would be funny if he just floated up there (laughs) but (laughs) um so then we are back in the inside of the death star back into the bay and the crewmen are carrying a heavy box on board the ship and this is like another one of those scenes like this next couple set of scenes are ones that are still have me on the edge of my seat but also like i know that it will play out but Right now there's like change up, there's confusing stuff happening that is like logistical, I don't know. For me, this is, um, if I were directing, this would be like the hardest part for me to direct where you have to uh, succinctly convey that people are hiding in boxes and things are getting to a certain place and that things are like, I don't know, there's just like so much hidden and so much subterfuge here that it is... It's confusing. Um, it's it's a little bit confusing to keep track of, except not really because the music um, kind of guides. You know, the guy mm-hmm. the music is kind of an anchor. Like I'm notoriously like really bad at uh, understanding scenes like this, and let alone directing them. But um, yeah, what do you think of it? Do you know what I mean? The I, subterfuge. It, yeah, I, it's so interesting because. Again, I need to start watching Star Wars movies more closely. Apparently, um, but I really cannot think of another Star Wars scene that takes place so much off screen, if that makes sense, right? We're really having to, as soon as they wheel that up, I counted there's 27 seconds of no on-screen dialogue, right? It's all happening away from us and we're only being driven by sound effects and by the music and having to hear the clanking and the blaster bolts and figuring out what's happening. And it's very interesting because I feel like you understand when Luke comes out wearing the Stormtrooper outfit. You're like, I under- okay, I get what happened in there. Right. But it really has to tell a story in 30 seconds without them, you know, k- killing Stormtroopers off screen and like taking off their armor and putting, you know, it's a very um, uh, concise way of doing it. It's very interesting. Uh, it's very concise. Interesting. Yeah. And the sound, at, the sound pulls it off, like, or the sound is yeah. one of the many things that pulls it off. But the sound especially, like, Um, when we hear, you know, the, what is it like we hear punches or like we hear, um, it's in the background point is because it's off because it's off screen, but we know that it's happening behind the door. Like we know that Mm -hmm. it's happening and we hear that the sound effect is not present. We hear that it's coming from another place. The ship's all yours. If the scanners pick up anything, report it immediately. All right, let's go. Now they're getting on the ship. We're going to hear crashing. Hey, Don, 
down there. Could you give us a hand with this? And those repeated. TK421, why aren't you? So all of that, like those shots that we hear are not like right, right in front of us. They're like shots in another room. Mm -hmm. And then the repeated of the woodwinds kind of just repeating the same note. It feels to me like waiting for something to happen. Yeah. Something's happening. Just stand by. It'll be done in a minute. (laughs) That's what it sounds like to me. It's yeah. Okay. It, the whole, that score is so interesting. And I'm going to keep saying, because I don't, I guess, listen closely enough, but it really almost doesn't feel Star Wars. Like, I feel like we don't get a lot of like suspenseful sections like that. And and that the, the high pitchedness of it all, it reminded me of, of really uh, Raiders kind of um, and the score to Raiders, especially early when they're wheeling it in. But the whole thing, I could imagine just being tempted onto a, a Raider scene almost rather than a, a different Star Wars scene. And it kind of is an interesting flow. Do you mean um, because there's no, because there's little music? No, I would say not even because there's little music. Um, I don't know if you want to rewind. There's a, there's a, I don't know how to describe. There's a, okay. a section at the very beginning that is kind of a fluttery. Okay. Uh, Before or after? Reported immediately. All right, let's go. That whole section, and then you, you hit it right when it started, and a little bit before that. I was okay. going to say that. Who's the more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? Oh. Number 111, number 111. This part right here. The ship's all yours. If the scanners pick up anything, report it immediately. Which is the Imperials motif. Mm hmm. But I, I think I don't know. I don't know, like, why it makes me feel like like Raiders. Right. And especially like uh, the the Well of Souls element of Raiders and the whole like secondary second act of Raiders. Um, but that that was just kind of a note that I, I put nothing, nothing more. <laughs> Reminds you of Raiders there. I'm going to have to I'm not an expert on Raiders, but um, <laughs> uh so you might be, you, I might think the same thing, but I would just have to go back and check. I, I'm um, very interested. I'm very interested in the uh, fact checking that will happen after this episode of you being see, like, Brandon, you, you dumb dumb. Well, <laughs> like, no, no, no. Are... Cause something like that's not a fact check even. It's just like, if something reminds you of something and you can't describe why, that doesn't mean you're wrong. And that doesn't mean that there's a fact that can prove it. Even if I, like I were to listen to it and I would hear the same thing or I, if I were to listen to Raiders and say like, I hear it too. That's still not like a fact check. That's just both of us <laughs> both are hearing the same thing that we can't yeah. necessarily put our finger on. Um, so yeah, it could be because something happened in your childhood um, <laughs> with those scenes at the same time. And it would still yeah. be true if one reminded you of the other. It just doesn't mean that everyone else will, your results will apply to everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there we get the mo- Imperials motif, which is, you know, what we have in this film because we don't have the Imperial March yet. So we just have that muted trumpet. And some more uh, timpani. Timpani doing a lot of work in this scene. Um, boom. Then we have um, TK421. Why aren't you at your post? TK421, do you copy? And um, a stormtrooper comes down the ramp of the pirate ship and waves to the gantry officer, indicating that his comm isn't working. That's what the um, screenplay says. And, of course, we know that that stormtrooper is not a stormtrooper. Who could it be? Who could, who could, it, who be? could it be? I do, again, I really, this is such a gift of being able to watch it this way because I've never heard like when he's making the motion on the helmet to point that his comms aren't working there's a slight bit of static like there's a small sound effect that's that's there which is so cool um and i was like oh i've never heard that before never noticed that it was very very neat 
And something happens in the we in the back of Imperial's motif again. We hear these like little plucks in the background. I don't like know if it means anything or, or anything. I just wanted to point it out as an interesting piece of orchestration. Um, so if anyone listening knows who orchestrated the scene, um, I'd be curious, but I'll play it for you. TK421, why aren't you at your post? TK421, do you copy? Take over. We've got a bad transmitter. I'll see what I can do. Okay, that part at the end there. For some odd reason, that just satisfies me so much. <laughs> it goes like... And then it's like... And when it goes here, it like kind of sounds like... Um, it almost sounds like a synthesizer, but I don't think mm -hmm. it is. Like it goes from sounding kind of like a harp or something to something more electronic. Um, I'll play it again in case anyone listening appreciates that little detail. <laughs> Take over. We've got a bad transmitter. I'll see what I can do. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you could already hear the beginning of the next part, which is um, some raucous, chewy action. The door slides open, satisfying sound. And it's just like all hell breaks loose. Um, and Chewbacca, um, the, sc the screenplay says a, the giant Wookiee flattens the officer with one blow, which is like, does he kill him? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> um, but the timing is funny. Uh, watching Chewbacca do this, like at the time that this is being recorded, like we've just seen in the book of Boba Fett, a Wookiee have a face off with a human. <laughs> and yeah, I guess we should we should not forget that Chewbacca has it in him. He's very powerful. Yeah. So... Um, that happens. Uh, maybe he's dead. Maybe he's not. Um, yeah. So, oh, well, he is dead after Han blasts, it, blasts him. That's that's a thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How could I forget? Yeah. And then we hear the main theme. We'll get to that. This is obviously the Chewbacca stuff. Which is like really funny to me. It's really funny. It's very interesting how we're talking soundscape so much. And that's such like a, a cacophony before, right? It's just so much happening. It reminds me of when the troopers initially like break into the blockade runner at the start of the movie, right? Where there's just so much happening and you can barely hear the score almost because it's just like loud noises. And it's a similar thing here that then is kind of alleviated by by the main theme by by this nice kind yeah, of alleviated is yeah it's kind of like you go into the into the fray and emerge like you dust yourself off <laughs> and put on a fresh you know some fresh clothes and you're like mm, we're fine nothing to see here <laughs> uh, it's like such a quaint like version of the main theme and we do hear that throughout the movie so at this point it's not like uncommon to hear it that way i mean i think the only like the main fanfare that we hear in the like in the opening crawl is obviously not what this is this is like a nice little oboe or like woodwinds mm -hmm. and it's just um it sounds so sweet it sounds after emerging from that storm <laughs> um so good yeah. So then um, there's some more, you know, figuring figuring things out, a little bit of fighting. Between his, his howling and your blasting, everything in sight, it's a wonder this whole station doesn't know we're here. Um, so Luke wants to be a little bit more subtle, and Han's like, you know, blasting everything. And Han, bring them on. I'd prefer a straight fight to all this sneaking around. And then the music fades out, which is the main theme. 
or it fades out for the rest of, the, of these minutes. So there's one minute left of this, and then the whole rest of um, this set of minutes has no music. That's very interesting. Does it um, not music wise, but does Hans' line there sound just extra crisp to you? It sounds like very ADR. Or like maybe the mic was very good, but like especially compared to Luke. Let's hear it because there you know. Han sometimes has little parts of lines where I feel like it's coming where it does it, where the ADR is really more obvious. But let's hear. You know, between his howling and you're blasting everything inside, it's a wonder the whole station doesn't know we're here. Well, bring him on. I prefer a straight fight to all this sneaking around. We found the computer outlet, sir. Plug in. You should be able to... I hear. The entire... yeah. It sounds different. And, yeah. I don't know if it's because he's facing a different direction, and that's how my brain registers it, but <laughs> it definitely sounds a little bit crisp, crisper or yeah. something. Drier, yeah, maybe. I'm glad I'm not, I'm glad I'm not uh, just, just hearing things. Yeah, no, it does sound different to me too. Um, and this part has a this next part when 3PO is like they're doing computer stuff basically. So this is the part where 3PO is like, "We found the computer outlet, sir," and Obi Wan starts like doing stuff to the computer, like he just he knows how to use this computer. And um, a map of the city pops up, and R 2s doing stuff and and whistling, and Obi Wan's. Like, plug in. He should be able to interpret the entire Imperial network, which is like a very, uh, reading it like in terms of the 70s, that's pretty, I don't know, that's that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, um, and then 3PO, um, or R2 clearly has um, found something else. And this is after he punches his arm into the socket and, you know, does that awesome like R2 I don't know, like the claw arm thing, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. and um, 3PO translates and says, he says he's found the main controls to the power beam that's holding the ship here. He'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. And then the sound happens here. And um, it sounds like this repetitive sound that happens when you're like either key smashing something or you're like, a screen is like rapidly changing views mm -hmm. like a it almost reminds you like an old school projector maybe like mm -hmm, like a slide a slide um that's what it is aerosol. slides yeah or like i wrote in my notes but slides is a much better way to think of it like when you're frustrated and you're just pressing a button over and over refreshing the page and so PPO <laughs> is doing a little like show and tell here um, the tractor beam is coupled to the main reactor in seven locations. A power loss at one of the terminals will allow the ship to leave. So I'll play it. But the that sound happens after 3PO says, he'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. Okay, let's see. R2 with his socket. He says he's found the main controls to the power beam that's holding the ship here. He'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. The tractor beam is coupled to the main reactor in seven locations. A power loss at one of the terminals will allow the ship to leave. It's really fast. It's like... Yeah. It's, um, and the sound itself is a microfiche. Like it's it's an old it's like when you would go to the library and you'd have to like find an old newspaper and scan it in and that's how you kind of see it and it was something Ben Burt found while he was on a documentary shoot for USC at an astronomer's office was this sound which is very cool so it's very similar to what we were talking about though with like a carousel or a slide projector it's a very mm. it's like one degree away because that it's such a cool sound and such a cool like just it's so quick and, uh, and obviously it changes like w that's how fast 3po is changing screens it's really yeah. fast which yeah. is funny uh, that's like it it's a tempo suited to the modern day um but i don't know yeah. actually i don't i don't know i shouldn't say that I, i'm sure people used to go through slides really quickly too so i shouldn't say that but um <laughs> well, let's hear it again because it's very satisfying He says he's found the main controls to the power beam that's holding the ship here. He'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. The tractor beam is coupled to the main reactor in seven locations. A power loss at one of the terminals will allow the ship to leave. Yeah. 
<laughs> I love it. Yeah, me too. And at one point, like it's steady, but then at one point it kind of hiccups. Like mm-hmm. maybe he didn't press the button or the re- <laughs> didn't press the button at the same speed or something. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, so now we're nearing the end of the minutes and Ben is saying like, I don't, I don't think you boys can help. I must go alone. And Han doesn't care. He's like, whatever you say. <laughs> I've done more than I bargained for on this trip already. Luke is, you know, I want to go with you. And then the very last line of this set of minutes is, be patient, Luke. Stay and watch over the droids. They must be delivered safely, or other star systems will suffer the same fate as Alderan. Your destiny lies along a different path from mine. Ooh, it's a good place to end. Who knows what he says after that? We'll now. Ne- I'll never know. I'll never. I'll never find never. out. It definitely is not um, one of the most iconic lines in, in Star Wars. Definitely not. He conveys a lot in those lines, and maybe I just think that because now we've had so much other media fill in gaps. Um, but basically, like the skeleton that was set forth in this film, it had a lot of like nice gaps like basically like a lot of nice things that you could you could expand on but you don't need to and so here Mm -hmm. it's like stay and watch over the droids they must be delivered safely okay so the stakes yes or other star systems will suffer the same fate and with no details of like what the other star systems are or like um your destiny lies along a different path from mine so yeah i mean that sums it up this is a good script i think (laughs) <laughs> hot take uh, star wars very well written <laughs> so good it, and it's it's very interesting just thinking about it in the grand scope of obi-wan's journey as well right he this is you know the last time that they really see each other besides before he, he dies and you know he has spent his whole you know the past 20 years protecting protecting luke and now after what it's been a day and a half that they have been together or whatever it is. And he's like, all right, now that, that is my time with you, at least on the physical realm, you know? And so it's, it's very interesting that he's able to remove himself, you know, cause I feel like it would be hard, you know, if you've spent that much time watching from afar and not really being a part of this person's life and then being like, okay, like, cause he knows he's going into danger. He knows that it's going to, you know, not end well. I feel like even when he's saying destinies and stuff, you wouldn't be saying destinies very, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Right. But he knows that. This is probably the end. Yeah. I don't think he's thinking that the end is a bad thing, though. Yeah. Um, I think he just... I mean, obviously, he goes into that... Alt- it's not even an altercation. He accepts his fate. Like, he already he already knows right. what has to happen. Um, and, of course, this is sort of the mentor... Old mentor has to die at the beginning of the hero's journey type of trope. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's just... They just part ways like this. Like, um, I I... You know, they don't part ways like um, on acts. Like it's not a happenstance parting. It's it's not like they didn't intend to part, but then Luke witnesses Obi-Wan dying later. It's like Ben has said his goodbye. Like mm-hmm. he's, he's preparing. He's been preparing Luke. Like this is him just preparing Luke. You know, it's not going to be a surprise um, when he right. dies. And he's kind of already like, not that he's saying, Luke, I'm going to die in 10 minutes. He's not saying that, but he is, you know, telling Luke like his last wish, like he's telling Luke like stuff about his destiny and whatever. It's He's not going to be cut off in the middle of a sentence, put it that way. Right. Yeah. So um, that is this set of minutes. The <laughs> themes um, that we heard are martial rhythm, which is the... Er, that thing. Um, <laughs> And the Rebel Fanfare, it's hard, it's so fast to play the triplets. The Rebel Fanfare, um, the Force theme, the Imperials motif, and the main theme. Do, 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 do. And on the soundtrack, we're still in the track called Inner City, which really jumps all over the place. We've been on this track for like <laughs> episodes, many episodes, like many episodes of this show. But, you know, it's not always in order, um, the stuff on the track. So um, let's see. Before we do the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire, I want to read a couple listener comments. One of them is from um, one of them is from David Cornett on Twitter. This was about the Jabba. This was about the Greedo episode, 
which was, I think, I don't remember the number, I don't remember the number, 11 maybe. Um, and we were talking about Greedo's voice and we were talking about him stepping on uh, Jabba's, t Han stepping on Jabba's tail and uh, stuff like that. And I stand corrected that um, Han stepped on his tail. Okay, wait, I'll just read the comment. As you can see here, the reason they make Han step on his tail is that he walked behind the human-sized actor at a time when the design of the character had not been done. They had no idea who would have a tail. So, yeah, true. I always, like, I always forget that about the human thing, about, like, they didn't know that the that there's a tail. Like, it's not intentional. It wasn't yeah. intentionally staged to be like, and now step on his tail. Like, right. no, no, no. Um, and then also the repeated dialogue in the scene must have been added to the Greedo scene after they decided to delete the Jabba scene. And what I'm talking about there is, I, I was mentioning that they say, um, we all get boarded sometimes. Look, Jabba, we all get boarded. Like, he kind of says that line to both characters. And so, mm -hmm. um, David says, I believe Han's face is off screen when he says these lines. So mm. it was probably ADR and obviously Greedo's subtitles were done last. So, Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to read was a um, a comment from Max Gill, which was about the DSRA episode with Alex Ludwig. And um, he said that he concur. Alex, if you're listening. Um, so Max says, I concur with you and have always felt that the use of the four note DSRA sequence during the burning homestead scene represents something more complicated than just tragedy and death. The sequence coincides with a moment that I think is one of Mark Hamill's best moments of acting in the film. We see him look away from the charred corpses of his aunt and uncle, and then he looks back, but when he does so, he seemed transformed in a fundamental way. It's as if he's aged five years, from childhood to adulthood, from a limited understanding of the galaxy to a full comprehension of the darker forces that control it. However, there is also a resolution on his face that has its counterpart in the DSRA sequence that is fully verbalized by Luke in the next scene when he agrees to follow Obi-Wan on his quest. We didn't even need the dialogue. It is all there in the performance and in the music. So powerful and compelling. And so there we were just talking about when Luke discovers his aunt and uncle charred corpses and we hear the force theme with the DSRA in the background. So there are different reading, read, reads that people have on that. On that. So if you want to learn more about that, go back to episode nine called Diagnosing DSRA. Um, so thank you for the comments. Um, before we wrap up, we have to do the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire. <laughs> Are you ready, Brandon? I'm ready. Uh, hopefully I'm ready, but I did, um, I did at least think through it. All right. Question number one is in exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? Okay. I said Ben... John and James. So Ben Burt, John Williams, James Earl Jones. I feel like without those three, and I felt like it was also different parts of, of Star Wars, right? It was sound effects, it was acting, and it was the the musical score. So I thought that was a good kind of representation for the entire soundscape. Because again, without it's it's also James Earl Jones's birthday the day we're recording this, and so that was oh, fresh in my mind. Oh my gosh. Was, Happy Thank birthday, James Earl Jones. Happy birthday, James Earl Jones. Oh. Yes. So Ben, John, and James would be my, would be my three words. I love it. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating people do this, but um, it kind of reminds me of those shirts that are like John and Ringo and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. blah. But this sounds like Bible <laughs> names or something. Um, like, <laughs> you could replace like a Bible thing with, but maybe, maybe not, but, <laughs> but you could. Um, you could, yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> moving on. What's something related to Star Wars music or sound that you want to learn more about? I, this is very selfish of me because I feel like everything we're talking about now is is relatively well documented, right? Original trilogy, especially the the sound and, and how everything was done was very well documented. The prequels also very well documented because Ben Britt was still such a big part of the process. And then now the past five years, six years, however long it's been, we haven't gotten as much, right? And part of that Do you is mean because for sound design, sound design, and and um, I think we've gotten a little bit of John Williams stuff, right? Obviously, we know what he's doing with all the, the themes. I would love more Ludwig stuff, um, specifically, right? Of of how his process has been going, and then how that's evolving. I think it's interesting with Book of Boba Fett, with I cannot remember the new composer's Joseph name, Shirley. uh, but like how that evolves, right? When live action Star Wars sounds so different. 
uh, on TV than it does in movies. Um, so that's a long way of saying I just want more behind the scenes stuff of, of both sound design and and soundtracking. In the post, basically in the Disney era. In the post, yeah, in the Disney era. More behind. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you're not the only person to say something of that sort, and it is definitely like a question that a lot of people have in the back of their minds. Me certainly too, of like how the music and sound are evolving and what parts are going like what will be consistent when right. all the personnel has changed um they are important questions to consider on all fronts of star wars as hands get changed or whatever yeah. that phrase is um so the final question is what is any score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything star wars so I, I was gonna say Lord of the Rings, but I feel like that's cliche. I feel like that's like if someone was like, I love John Williams Star Wars, so like, and I love Lord of the Rings, but I also love I Lord. So I was gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go wild card a little bit. I'm gonna say John Carpenter specifically, John Carpenter Halloween, um, but really any John Carpenter is so good, <laughs> and and that's a whole different element um, to like the love I have of soundtracks, right? The kind of synthy more um artificial is the wrong word but that whole side of things is really something that always kind of um draws me in so anything john carpenter specifically the original halloween oh john carpenter okay okay i thought you're at first i thought you're talking about a, uh, a movie called john carpenter halloween and i was like oh, oh. <laughs> yeah yeah that's no. a twist <laughs> no no so the original uh, halloween the original I'll Halloween. Say. okay awesome that's fun um uh, thank you so much for uh, talking with me today, Brandon. Where can people find your stuff and can, like maybe give like a little plug for what you do? Because I think it's very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. That You can find me anywhere on Twitter and Instagram. Mostly Twitter is where I kind of mess around. But uh, Twitter at TalkMe94 and then podcast TalkMe94 wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, new episodes are coming um, very soon with some really, really cool guests. But I do one-on-one -on -one interviews with the cast crew and creators of star wars um so it could be like we were saying visual effects people or people underneath the masks or um sam witwer or emily swallow greg grunberg there's a lot of Do you different... have any favorites my favorite uh there's a few that i uh i'm very fond of i'm very fond of when i actually got to talk to dennis murin who's always been one of my heroes and that was like a very big deal for me um but one of my favorites is um with his name is Greg Proops. He's a comedian. He was on Whose Lines It Anyway. Um, and he was one of the pod race announcers uh, <gasps> in episode one. He was one of the two-headed pod race announcers. And he did it with his comedy partner. And I sent him a message. It was very early on in the podcast. And I sent him a message like, hey, like if you wanted to talk about Star Wars, I see you're coming to where I live. And I'm going to your show if you wanted to. And he's like, yeah, I never get to talk about Star Wars. And so after his show, he invited me to the green room. And just smoked a cigarette for 30 minutes and just like did a whole different stand up show just privately for me and my producer and like his opening act uh, and telling all these crazy so great like, stories. He was like one of the Bunta Eve classic yeah. announcer. He's the one that speaks in English, not the one that speaks in Hatties. Uh, and it was, it's, it's, I'm very, still very proud of that one because it's not a story I heard that often. And he was so funny and so nice to do it. Um, and it's an easy one to like listen to first and be like, okay, like that was fun before I get into like semantics, which are later episodes. Um, <laughs> awesome. so, uh, and Dennis Murin yeah. is like an ILM guy. Dennis like Murin is, is one of the original founders of ILM or, or one of the earliest members of ILM. Um, and then was probably the longest tenured employee by the time he, he's semi-retired at this point, but he is right now um, the most um, he has won the most Academy Awards of any living person is Dennis Murin. Um, and then he's only beaten, I think, by Walt Disney. Um, so yeah, Dennis Murin, good, uh, <laughs> important person. Uh, it's a very, very cool to talk to. Wow. Did he win for visual effects? Yes, yes, yes. He won yeah. for visual effects across um, most of the Star Wars movies and then for Indiana Jones and then I believe for... Anyway, there's a, you can find his whole oh, wow. That's awesome. yeah, yeah, he yeah, did everything. Cool. So yes, check out Talking Bay 94, spelled like Docking Bay 94, but talking instead of <laughs> docking. 
Yes, and, I was very proud. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and you can follow Star Wars Music Minute on all of the social media platforms. Um, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, kind of. I don't really post at the moment. Um, Twitter at Star Wars Musemin. And you can drop me an email if you have something a little bit longer to say, um, like Max did, at podcast at Star Wars Music Minute dot com. And there's also a com link on my website where you can leave a voice message or you can like do your best Chewbacca sound or leave a message for someone who comes later on in the film. So that's at starwarsmusicminute.com slash com link. With that, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week talking about Star Wars episode four minutes 71 through 75. May the force be with you. Thank you.